Hello everyone and welcome to today's session on how we can simplify the development using the modern developer tools. I'm Satya Sekar, Senior Developer Evangelist and I work with the APAC Developer Relations team and you can reach me on Twitter as Satya SFTC. Okay, let's get started. But before we start, let me quickly remind you that in our session today, we might be talking about a few product features that are not yet generally available on the Salesforce platform. So if you are planning to make any purchase decisions, please base your decisions only on what are currently available on the platform. Today's agenda is going to be pretty simple and it's all about exploring the easy ways to build with the modern developer tools. Whether you are working with the version control system or Sockle, Maybe you want to import some data into your org or maybe you want to export some data from the org. Maybe you want to work on Apex, Aura or LWC. We'll try to find the best tools from the latest developer tools. And we'll also try to build an end-to-end -end use case covering all these concepts. What do you do in a typical app life cycle? You start with a plan to implement the project, build it and release it. And in the process, you work on different environments like build environment, testing environment, staging and UAT environments before deploying it to the production. While you work on these environments, you may be working on different tools for coding, building and testing your applications. Now, how do you move code from one environment to the other environment? You have various options including chain sets, metadata API and also the latest packaging models. That is how the typical application lifecycle looks like. But what are the major concerns for the developers with that? There may be different developers working between different environments, leaving a possibility for conflicts between the environments. There might also be overlap of the environments with multiple configurations. One major problem that I see here is there is no single source of truth in this model. By source of truth, I mean source code. You may end up having different set of source code in different environments and it is very difficult to trace and fix it. This can also lead to inconsistent deployments. While you can build your applications using different tools and development processes, Salesforce highly encourages the use of Salesforce DX for its rich suite of tools. But what is so great about it? Let us see that. Salesforce listened to the developers working on the platform and also those who had refused to use the platform. In the year 2015, Salesforce has come up with an initiative called Salesforce Developer Experience. The whole idea was to address the gap in tooling and the customer frustrations with our developer stack. Salesforce DX is built on the key principles of modern software delivery. And in the year 2017, we released a suite of products to fulfill this promise and modernize. It provides tools for every phase of development, whether it is planning, code, build, test or release. It has CLI, which is optimized to work with all kinds of orgs and environments. CLI is a kind of consolidation of APIs and tools that are scattered across all over the different environments. And it is a very flexible tool. It can be used for development as well as the automations. And the Salesforce DX also supports packages for easy releases, while it also supports the concept of ephemeral orgs, which are otherwise called as scratch orgs. When you create the scratch orgs, they are empty and you can create the scratch orgs of any shape that you like by configuring the scratch org before creating it. And these orgs are short lived and can be easily be created and disposed. You can work with these scratch orgs using our Visual Studio Code extensions. Today, Salesforce DX is part of our DNA. It is a promise. It is open with support for open source, open roadmap, open ecosystem and open tooling. Now, let us see how we can use this Salesforce DX for our software development. But before that, let us see the different development models. 
Essentially, there are two development models. Org development model, which can otherwise be called as unpackaged development model, and the other one is packaged development model. As the slide shows here, in the org development model, the complete metadata lives within the production org. It's like a compartment holding everything in it. The release artifact in this model is a set of metadata changes, which is delta related to what is in production org. The developers can use the sandbox to build the customizations and then migrate the change set to the production org. On the other hand, the package development model is the modern development model. The releases can be easily managed with this model as the changes are organized as packages instead of one big release. Both org development model and the package development model is supported by Salesforce DX. Now let's see how the org development model looks like for a declarative org. Here the code is promoted through change sets. As you can see in the slide, change sets are promoted from the developer sandbox in the leftmost compartment to the developer pro sandbox in the build phase using the setup UI. It is further promoted to the test and release phases. As you can see here, you can use various kinds of sandboxes for different phases of development and move the changes across phases using change sets. Now, let's see uh, how the org development model looks like for the programmatic org. The only major difference here is you can see here all the changes can be aggregated in the source control and changes can be released via CLI. You can use the CLI commands to deploy the changes and also retrieve the changes from the org. It also supports metadata API to deploy and retrieve the source code. Now you can convert your Salesforce DX project structure into the metadata API project structure and you can also deploy it uh, as a metadata API. Now let's see how the package development model looks like. It is a source driven development model where code and configuration can be logically grouped into packages and released. It can be tracked in the source control. Updates can be released with new package versions and it supports scratch offs. You can use CLI commands to push and pull the changes from the scratch offs. And most importantly, the package development model allows you to create self-contained applications or libraries that are deployed to your org as a single package. Okay, that's all about the development models, but wait, what development model are we going to use today? We are going to use a generic Salesforce development model which utilizes common development patterns for your application lifecycle. It provides common tooling like IDEs, CLI, packaging, CI and CD. You can develop and build with our development orgs along with PS code. It is source driven development and you can see at the bottom that VCS spans across all the development phases. You can also further test and release with our CLI and test environments. Okay, it is coding time now, but wait, what tools are we going to use today? We'll be using Visual Studio Code and our awesome Salesforce extensions on it. We'll also be using Salesforce CLI and we will build by prototyping our components with the support of local development. We'll also see how our components looks like in the mobile as well. Fine. What component are we going to build today? I want to keep it simple and at the same time elegant so that it uses the most of the features so that I can showcase those features as part of the development process. So it should contain something like Sockle, Apex, JavaScript, HTML, SLDS, and we should be using the Salesforce DX for building our component. Maybe we can create a component which gets a list of records from the org and displays it. In fact, I'll recreate one of the recipes from the LWC uh, recipes app of the sample gallery. For those who don't know what is uh, sample gallery, it is a collection of sample applications with the reference code implemented using best practices. 
and you can refer to that code as and when you need it. So what are we going to do today? We are going to build a contact list right from scratch and display it using the Lighting Web Components. Let me also tell you that I've chosen this use case primarily to focus on learning the tooling rather than creating a complex LWC component. We are going to follow a source driven development approach. So let's get started from our version control system. We can in fact use Kit as it is supported out of the box in your Visual Studio Code environment. And we are going to use the GitHub to manage the collaboration with our team members. For many developers, especially beginners, Kit is not an easy go as we might not be familiar with the commands and CLI. So if you mess up with the GitHub commands, there is always a probability that we might run into trouble. But no worries, we'll see how we can make it simple. Today, we are going to create a new repository called Tools Demo. And then we'll see how we can get that source code into our developer environment. Git provides us some options. The first option is a collection of uh, commands. So you start by running the git init in your local system and then add the remote site, make some commits, make sure that it is properly pushed and it all looks complex, right? So we are going to choose the other option with which we can get the source code onto your local development environment just by few clicks. And we'll choose this option for today's session. We'll now go create repository and set up the development environment for our working. Okay, currently I'm in my GitHub account where I can create a new repository by clicking the new button here. It takes us to the create new repository page where you can give the name for your repository. Let's call it as tools demo. And you can keep it public, which is default, or you can also make it as private if you want to keep it to yourself. And again, if you want to add some initialization files, you can do that by checking any of these boxes. For now, I'm not going to initialize either readme or git ignore or any of the license files. So here the license can be an open source license if you want to open source your source code. But let, let's keep it, keep these things empty and click on create repository. It takes us to the page where it gives us the choices on how to import the source code onto your local system. So one option, as I said earlier, is by using these git commands like git init and then git remote add by adding the your URL, repository URL as origin and finally pushing it. But again, I'm not going to use these things as I promised and we will select this URL, GitHub repository URL and go back to our Visual Studio Code environment. So here you can see that we are in the Visual Studio Code environment. If you click on the Explorer button, we have two choices. Either you can click on open folder or you can click on clone repository. If you already have the source code on your system in some folder, then you can use the first button. But in our case, we are going to use the clone repository and paste the URL that we have just copied and press enter. It uh, asks us to save in some location. So let me select desktop so that it will be easy for us to access further. And I'll select repository location button and it's going to save it at that location and shows us a pop-up where if you click on open, we'll open that folder in your Visual Studio Code environment. So far, so good. Now you have your folder and at the bottom you can see that it shows that we are currently in the master branch. Okay, let's close this welcome and you can also close this explorer. Again, you can use the shortcut key if you want to. You can use command B on Mac or control B on Windows. We can launch the command palette from where we can create the SFDX project. The other option would be to do it from your terminal. So let's click on view button and click on command palette. Again, you can launch the command palette using the shortcut key command shift P for Mac and control shift P for Windows. So here when you type SFDX, 
it shows all the SFDX commands. So we'll use the create project command and let's select standard and let's use the name tools minus demo. Okay. Yep. And we'll save it in the desktop location itself and say create project. There you see a warning because we have earlier created the folder called tools demo when we imported the code and with the same name we are creating the project. Never mind. Click overwrite. Okay. Now you can see that here it shows there are 16 files that are changed. Even if you open this explorer, you can see all the files that it has created with this uh, create project command and all the files are in green color. Uh, which means we have not committed those uh, com that source code in your github repository yet so if you click on this icon you can see that these are the files which are currently untracked and it is indicated by symbol u and at the bottom you can see that you are on the master branch and it shows a star which indicates that there are some changed files which are yet to be committed so you can give some commit message but before that let us stage these changes by clicking plus it's as equivalent to running the command git add dot in your project folder and now this is changed to a which indicates that all these files are added to commit let's give a message say first commit and you can click this check mark button or tick button which is going to commit alternatively you can click these three dots and go to the commit and press commit here yep we'll choose this tick mark which commits the changes and once the changes are committed you can see that the master is not showing star anymore which means you are coming your changes are committed now you can push those changes to your github repository by using the push command and there you go all the changes are pushed and if you go back here and refresh your page you can see that all the files are committed and you can see your very first commit here and the files are committed to the master branch so far so great let's go back to our slides now okay so what next we have created our repository and we also made our very first commit now let us see how we can set up our environment and then we'll also configure it so that it will be easy for our development and we'll get acquainted by navigating through our development environment and finally we'll see how easy it is to work with cli with the latest updates now let's go ahead and see how it works we are back in our visual studio code and let's see how we can configure our settings so to configure the settings you can launch the setup which you can do by going to the code preferences and setup alternatively you can also use this shortcut command comma on mac or control comma on windows so let me do that let us say command comma it launches the settings file and here you can see there are two ways of uh, configuring the settings one is for the user when you do it at the user level whatever configuration settings you do applies to all the users who are going to use this visual studio code application and when you do the settings at the workspace level they apply to a specific workspace currently we have not created any workspace for our project but by default it creates internally a workspace for us and those settings will be applied to this folder so let's go ahead and see what happens when we create a workspace now let's go and save this project in a workspace let's call, say save workspace as give some name let uh, let me in fact call it as say tools demo code workspace which is absolutely fine and save it in the same desktop location so that it will be easy for us to access 
Okay, now I saved it as a workspace. One change you can see here is it shows workspace in the parentheses there. And the other major change you can see here is it added a folder level settings as well. Now, when you saved it as a workspace, you can add one or more projects to your workspace. So in this case, when you click on this folder, you can see there is a tools demo folder. Uh, which we have created that is our project if you add more folders or more projects there those also will be listed and then again you can configure settings with respect to each of those projects that's great let's see what are the settings that we have here we have settings for the text editor workbench and uh, applications and even the extensions here you have settings for all the extensions including the salesforce extension okay you can make the changes in the settings you can search for a particular set setting here say for instance like editor setting so you can make the changes to the configuration file right from here but again if you want to make the changes uh, using the json format right if you want to say copy some uh, settings from the workspace into your folder settings and then edit those settings so that it will be uh, more related to your project then you can do that by clicking this icon here which launches the same settings file in the json format when i click this you can see currently i don't have any settings in my workspace so whatever settings apply to the user space automatically applies to my workspace but any setting if i want to specifically change for the workspace i can put it in the settings.xml or in the settings location for instance let's go back to the settings and click on user and again when we click on this you can see all the settings which applies to all the users are listed here so you can simply copy some of the settings from here into your workspace settings uh, .json file and uh, make those changes to suit your requirements similarly for the project as well and start using that this is how you can configure your settings and one more thing you should you would have noticed here while when i open my or saved my uh, project in my workspace you can see a error message displayed here it says that there is no default org set and it asking us to run a command create a default scratch org so we can create a default scratch org there uh, in order to do that we'll have to uh, set one of our orgs as a develop org which can keep track of our scratch orgs. To do that, let's go back to the terminal and now let's see how we can work with the CLI commands. So I'm currently in terminal. Let me maximize that. Here I'll type sfdx force org list and you can notice that I'm not fully typing the command. So I'm just typing a part of the command and pressing tab key which auto completes my command. This feature is called as auto completion, which will be really helpful when you don't remember the command name fully. And you can also type hyphen here and press tab. It shows all the possible options. So for now, I'll simply say forced org list and press enter. It is going to show all the orgs that are currently connected. So uh, let us go ahead and set one of the orgs as a default dev hub org. So I'll take the first one. So I can use the command say sfdx config colon set. So this is the command which I can use to set one of the orgs as the default uh, develop org. For those who might have used it earlier, you it might be a little confusing. Here I am saying sfdx config set while original command is forced config set. In, with the recent changes in the developer tools config commands are moved to its own namespace now you can simply say config set and then you can set default dev hub username dev hub username equal to i want to call it as a dev hub and this command works you can as well use force config set uh, but that command may probably be deprecated in near future now, when again I run the sftx force or glist command, okay. Now you can see that your dev hub org is set as the default dev hub org. Now we are good to go and create the scratch org, which I can do it right from the CLI, but I'm not going to do that. Let me close my terminal. I want to use the shortcuts. 
wherever possible. So here at the bottom, you can see there is no default arc set. You can click that and then you can select uh, one of the arcs as your scratch arc. But for this session, I want to create a new scratch arc. So let me say create a default scratch arc. And again, project scratch definition. If you want to make changes to the shape of your scratch arc, you can do that in the project scratch definition.json file. But for now, I want to use the default shape and i can give some name call let me call that call it as tools minus demo minus scratch okay it says alias can only contain underscores but not uh, any other alphanumeric characters so you can say tools underscore demo underscore scratch for that matter you can give any name so let me press enter and i can make the make it available for say, seven days to 30 days seven days being minimum 30 days being maximum and this is going to be short demo i can keep the default value as seven days and press enter now it runs that command it creates a default scratch arc for us so once it creates a default scratch arc you can see this bottom status bar i love this status bar for multiple reasons one primary reason is it shows me the status whenever i push the source code whenever i create a scratch arc whenever i there are some errors all these things will be re, uh, reflected in this status bar it acts like a dashboard for me okay for now you can see that uh, i have a default scratch arc i can in fact launch the scratch arc right from here okay uh, so we have done some work so far and even if you see here um i don't think there are any changes at the moment so we are not going to push anything uh, at a later point of time when we make the changes we'll make sure that we'll push the changes as and when we make the changes but now our scratch arc is ready let's see what we can do next our scratch arc is ready now we can start writing the code let's start with sockle first salesforce extensions provide us various options to write and run the sockle query we can write it in a dot sockle file and check how it works and when all is well we can use it in apex we can also highlight a sockle query from the dot sockle or apex files and run it and see the results we can even execute sockle query from the command palette and see the results now code completion is also supported for the sockle queries but make sure that you refresh a subject definitions from the command palette before using the code completion feature even if you forget to refresh the subject definitions no worries the latest salesforce extension update for vs code pops up a reminder message when you start your vs code to update uh, to refresh your subject definitions let's now go ahead and create a sockle query to retry the data from our org. And now that we are going to work on a new feature, what we'll do here is we will create a new branch called a feature branch. Let's call it as because we are creating a contact list, we can create a contact list feature branch. So you can click here at the bottom, you can click this master and then it launches the command palette with an option for create new branch alternatively you can also click on this uh, source control and from there also when you click on the three dots you can from create a new branch even from there so let's go ahead and let's call this branch as uh, contact list okay uh, good practice is to have use hyphen contact list feature branch okay and okay first let me click on create new branch and then it's going to create a contact list feature branch so here you can see at the bottom it has created a contact list feature branch and it automatically switched to that branch you can also verify it by opening your terminal and now when you see here uh, say git status it says that you are in contact list feature branch we are good to go let's work on our sockle query 
So I said there are different options. You can use the .sql file where you can write the command and see how the command works there. So when you create your Salesforce DX project, it creates a scripts folder for you automatically. And uh, this folder contains an Apex folder and a SQL folder. So let's click on the SQL folder. And here you can see a, there is a sample SQL file for you. So you can copy paste the sample SQL file and make the changes uh, or else you can use the same SQL file. Here I want to create a contact list. So what I'll do is I will copy this file and then I'll paste it in the same location, which in fact creates a copy for me. Let me rename it and let us call it as contact.sql. Okay, there you go. So we have a contact.sql file. So here um, we can write the SQL command dynamically. So I'll remove this SQL query and I want to write a fresh SQL query here for my contact. So for that I can say select and you can see that it gives a contact sense to help. So let me select this and here it, I can say type say contact and I can select the contact from here and again press tab I can say ID comma say uh, control space and I can say first name okay and comma I can say last name that's it and this is how I can build the SQL query I can execute the SQL query by launching the command palette and typing say SQL there so here you can see that I have an option called a command called execute SQL query with current selected text. Let me do that. And I can use REST API or tooling API. Uh, so let me say REST API for now. It runs the command. And there you go. It has run the command and we got zero results. Obviously. Say I said in the presentation that whenever you create a scratch hog, a scratch hog is created with no data. So it's our responsibility to populate the data into a scratch org. So uh, we can do that. But before that, let us save the changes so far. And here, when you see uh, in the source control, you can see that one of the file is changed. So let us uh, add those changes and see how we can generate a pull request. So I just added those changes. And you can see A here. Let me give a commit message like say first SQL query. Uh, let us commit it. And then let us push those changes. Okay. Now it says that there is no branch by the name contact list feature branch. And there is no upstream for that branch. So that means that branch is not published yet in your GitHub account. So it gives us a choice whether you want to publish it. Let's say OK. So that it publishes that branch in our GitHub account. That means it's going to create a branch there. And then you can collaborate with your teammates, colleagues to uh, give comments on your SQL query. Though it's a pretty simple SQL query. So let's go ahead and see in the GitHub repository. Here you can see that uh, a contact list feature branch has recent pushes less than a minute. You can compare it and generate a pull request. Now you can see uh, different options. You have compared it and you can like, you no, know, you can change the comment here if you want. And these are the changes that we have just made to that SQL file. So we can create a pull request so that other people can look into that pull request and then they can give their comments. See, if you would have implemented some kind of continuous integration, it also runs those tests automatically. And then it also shows you if there are any conflicts with your uh, base branch. So here I just want to uh, merge my contact list feature branch with the master branch. But if I want to uh, merge it with a different branch, I can even do that. So for now, I have only two branches, master branch and the latest branch that I've created. So I can merge it. And then, so once I merge, I can also like you know, delete this branch. So now what I've done is I have opened a pull request and whatever changes I'm going to do, write down 
So all those changes are going to be added to the same pull request. Okay, so now the pull request is generated. Let's go back and uh, see what we can do next. Our Sockle query did not return any results as there is no data in our scratch job. Let us make sure that there is some data to work with when we create our component. We can enter data manually or we can use tools like data import wizard or data loader. We, can't, we want to keep these simple things simple. So let us use force data tree for our purpose. This command is driven by tree save API. We can use this command to export the data from an existing org and import the same to our scratch org. The export can return a maximum of 2000 records and the file to import can contain up to 200 records, which is more than sufficient for any scratch org. But if you want to work with bulk data, you can use bulk API driven force bulk commands. Not only that, you can also create, modify or delete individual records quickly using the force data record create, delete, get, update commands. No data files are needed in this case. Okay, let's get some data into our org now. Okay, I'm back in my Visual Studio Code environment. So here, let me close this file explorer for now because I want to use only terminal. So let me open terminal and also maximize it. So I want to import some data from an R to our scratch org. So let's see what command works best for us. So I can say SFTX force and say data, say tree. And I can say, uh, if I say tab, there are two options, import and export. So let me try import command and let us see the help file there. So whenever I'm not really very sure on how to use the commands, I refer to the help file and all the help files have similar kind of structure. It has a usage, it has a set of options and a description of each of those options and a final description with examples on how to use that. So in our case, I want to import the records. So there is an example here on first how to export that, export the records and then how to import the records. So here what I want to do is I can in fact directly copy this because I'm working on contact record. So I can export something like this. Say let me copy here. So I can export uh, by running a query called select ID last name first name from contact. It is going to export all that information into a separate file called contact.json. There's also another way of exporting here which is uh, called as a plan. So when you are exporting more than one related objects records, in that case, I suggest you go by a plan, copy an example from here. It is going to create a plan. It, it creates a structure of JSON files for you from where you can easily import. But our case is pretty simple. So let me copy this example right from here and paste it here. There you go. So once you run that command, it exports the data from one of the orgs. It says query return no results. Why? Because I haven't mentioned from which org I want to export. And I'm sure that there are there is some data, sample data in my dev hub org because the dev hub org is a developer edition org which comes with some sample data. So what I'll do is I'll use the same command but with a minus u option and give dev hub as the username so that it gets the data from the dev hub org. Let's press enter here. Okay, it says it has returned 20 records to contact.json file. So where does it create this contact.json file? If you open the explorer, here you can see that it has created contact.json file. And you can also notice that this is created outside your force app because contact.json file is not going to be pushed into your scratch org. That's great. Now, how do you import these contacts to your scratch org? Again, if you see the same example, this is how we have exported. Now let's copy the command to import the contact.json file. 
So I'll just paste the command here. So here I'm using the contact JSON file to import the data into my scratch out. So when I press enter, so because I already set my scratch out as the default org, so it imports this data by default into my scratch org. Now you know how to export the data from a org and also how to import the data into your scratch org. So we have made some changes, some progress here. So let's go ahead and push those changes by, by clicking the source control activity bar and then uh, here you can see that the contact.json file is created. So let's add that file and we can say simply say contact uh, records data. So we can commit those changes and then we can push those changes. So once push is completed, you can see that the revolving circle here stops means the push is completed. You can go back to your repository and refresh your pull request and here you can see that your second commit is also available okay let's go ahead and see what to do next okay so now we know how to import the data from one org to the other org okay so let's go ahead and see how we can work with the apex for me at least it looks like salesforce extension pack has a special consideration for apex as there are so many productivity features that I am overwhelmed. I will try to cover a few of those features while we code. Like the first one is it has code completion feature which provides intelligence that can be invoked with control space. It has many code snippets. Code snippets are boilerplate code which can be used for common programming constructs like for loop, if statement, etc. Salesforce extension provides some code snippets for most of the Apex language constructs like creating the class, generating ORI enabled methods, and then programming boilerplate code for iterations, conditionals, and many more. You can always ensure that code smartness by refreshing your S object definition from the command palette. When I say code smartness, I mean you can see the definition of an S object or navigate from one method to the other method and that all can be done once you refresh the s object definitions you can also use the features like go to definitions of for all the classes methods uh, whether it's a standard or custom objects you can see the definitions of the objects once you refresh the s object definitions there you can also find all differences of a specific property or method of a class. You can just type say at the rate symbol in the command palette to see the outline view of all the methods and properties in your class and quickly jump to a specific location. Say you do not uh, really scan through your apex file to see which method is written where. You can just type the at the rate symbol in the command palette and all the method names are displayed there and you can click a method name to go to that particular location and not only that you can see the syntax errors highlighted with a red squiggle not only that you can also refactor your code with the auto suggestions you can also run anonymous apex right from the visual studio code and if you have debugging enabled you can also do interactive debugging and isv debugging from your visual studio code environment so what we'll do now, we'll use some of these features to write our Apex code. Now, let's write some Apex here. So what I will do is I will close the Explorer. In fact, I can use the shortcut key for closing the Explorer and also close the terminal for now. Now I want to create an Apex class. I can launch the command palette and I can say sfdx create Apex class. I want to show you one more command here for any reason if you have ever came across a situation or if you have ever come across a situation as well that you don't see all the sfdx commands listed in the command palette then one solution there is to reload the windows so you can use a command called say reload window when you run this it automatically loads all your sfdx commands it is going to refresh your complete visual studio code environment 
anyway let us go ahead and create the apex class so i can i need not really type every point, uh, bit of the command so while i keep typing it matches and it shows the appropriate command here and i'll select create apex class let us call it as say contact list controller okay so i'll save it in my classes folder default folder that's absolutely fine now see that it has created a skeletal structure for us we can create a method maybe i can use the code snippets so how do you invoke the code snippet you can say command shift p and let me say snippet because that's what i remember i don't remember the complete command there's a command called insert snippet and once you do that it is going to load all the possible boilerplate code related to your apex class so now let's say add aura enabled here uh, you can select either public or global let me keep it as public and when i press tab it goes to the next place where i'll have to fill some details so let me say i'm going to return a list of contacts and i'll give the method name as get contacts okay and here i can say uh, return a socle query again so i've already written a socle query i can open that sql file so i can say command p and say contact dot socle so let me open that file here so i can once run this and check now whether my socle query is running or not because now at least i have some data in my scratch up it should run so i can launch the command palette and say sql okay uh, so i say sql here it doesn't show up my command to run the execute the socle query so let me say execute again okay uh, i said sql it's not sql it's socle right so let us select execute socle query with current selected text and i can use either rest api or tool api let me use rest api instead of tooling api so it runs that command and uh, if everything is good it's going to return some data for us okay it works the socket query work so simply copy the socket query and paste it in your code here and then uh, you can save it okay so here if you if you let us say if you forgot writing the semicolon that is automatically popped in your problems window here and here you can see the semicolon okay that is the problem so let us add that semicolon that problem will go away and i was also telling that you can in fact uh, use at the rate symbol here to see all the methods that are defined in your apex class it's so easy right okay and not only that i also want to use this method in my lightning web components using the wire service so what i can do is i can cacheable equal to true okay good let us save this and so far so good i can use a lot of other apex productivity features but again uh, due to limitation of time let's go ahead and see what we can do next but before that never forget to commit your changes okay let's say contact list controller okay and uh, let us add this even if you forget it is going to remind you but let us add this commit these changes and then finally push the changes okay now if you go here in the pull request you can see that it automatically adds it also checks for the compatibility whether you can merge the changes or not and then your pull request is updated okay now that we have created our apex controller let's go ahead and create our lwc components and creating lwc components is like a cakewalk using salesforce extensions the lwc extension builds on vs code's language features for html and javascript including syntax highlighting bracket matching and language specific code completions with intellisense 
It provides code completion for various LWC resources, including LWC syntax, at Salesforce corporate modules, Lightning API name completion in HTML attributes and tags, view documentation on hover, linting, code navigation, and the list goes on and on and on. You can also test your components using just framework from your Visual Studio Code environment. You can launch your tests from the activity bar and you can also check the code coverage. You can also configure the linting rules to suit your requirements. Last but not the least, my favorite, the local development. With local development, you can quickly prototype your application. You can check the changes dynamically while you are building your application. Not only that, now you can also check how your component looks like in the mobile as well. We'll see all of these things now while we build our component. So let's go ahead and build our component. Okay, let's go ahead and create our lighting web component. Let us launch the command palette and say sftx create lighting web component. Let's give the name of the component as contact list and press enter. So let's select the default location. Okay, now it has created a lighting component lighting web component by the name contact list and how do you see the files that are created you can go to the explorer and see the files here but there is one shortcut way here on the top you can see the path and i can click on contactlist.js to see other files in my component contactlist.html and also meta file if you don't see this then probably you have not enabled the breadcrumbs you can go and open the settings.json uh, or settings file you can search for breadcrumbs and here you can see that breadcrumbs are enabled so if i remove this check mark i'll not be able to see that path so always make sure that this check mark is enabled going back now let's see how we can import our contact list controllers method here in the lighting web component for that we can import say from open the single quotes you have your contact list controller method here you can directly import that let's copy it and then we can paste it here, get contacts, and we can use that in our class. Maybe we want to use the wire service there. Our regular practice of using wire service is to probably refer to the LWC recipes, go to the wire example, copy from there, and paste it here. Today, what we are going to do is, I'm going to show you how you can use the snippets for that wire service. One option is to launch the command palette and type insert snippet just like we have done for the Apex methods. The other way is you can say LWC and say control space, say I want to say wire. It shows me all the possible things. So wire to a function or wire to a property, so on and so forth. Now I want to use wire to a property. So here I can give the property name as get contacts then uh, method name as get contacts and property name as say contacts okay so i have created something like this and i don't send any parameters so i can remove the parameters because i'm seeing a squiggle there red squiggle there is a, probably some error okay uh, my error is not yet resolved so let's go to the problems tab here and see what is the error uh, it says that yeah invalid decorator usage and yep I got it we did not define the wire here so let's go ahead and define wire and there you can see that the error has went away and we can save it okay now we can use this contacts information in our uh, contact list.html to retrieve that information again to create the component we can also refer to our component library and get some uh, base lighting component like lightning card to beautify our component so what i can do is i can go to the component library here and i can search for card example and here you can see the card example 
um, where it also shows the preview there are different types of cards like basic card card with narrow variant so on and so forth so i'll be using the basic card but i don't want to use this command new command there so let me remove that okay and here instead of uh, paragraph maybe i want to use div and again you can see that if there's an error it shows that error there again so let me say slash div here and we can copy the complete code from here now the code looks good and go back here and paste that command here and we can save it now here in the card body i want to show the object so uh, it, it will be returning contacts and i can check whether the data is returned so let me save it and we can see the preview in fact i can see the preview in my uh, android emulator so let's go ahead and open the android emulator to see the preview okay the exit code is zero which means my android emulator is launched i can open that emulator here maybe i'll keep this side by side yeah and it shows a list of objects so what i can do here is i can in fact show them in a loop as a list so here i can use for loop so when i type for it shows an option here say for each and i can say contacts dot data and for each item contact i want to show that item here so to keep it simple let us close this terminal now you can see the complete code here and one good practice is whenever you are uh, printing something like in loop uh, specifically when you are printing the list it's always a good practice to check whether we have the data or not so we can use lwc if true i can check if contacts dot data is true then i will show this for each okay and when i save it you can notice that it automatically formats that how it's happening it's because of uh, say uh, one of the plugins called prettier which we are going to talk about a little later in the slides now i have contacts.data if the contacts.data is true then for each contact i want to show this information so maybe i want to use a paragraph tag and here i want to show say contact.name name or maybe contact.first name if i'm writing first name i can also say contact.first name okay let's save it again there is squiggle let's see what's wrong here let's launch the terminal and see in the problems uh say there is it says paragraph inside of iterator uh this should be key value yep so whenever you are iterating through a list of records you'll have to give the key value to uniquely identify your record in your html for the lighting web components so i can say contact dot id okay and see while you chose another the error is also displayed in your local development there let me save it and and one more good practice is you can also use uh, a if true for the if there is any problem in your data there so you can use if true uh, i can say contacts dot error i can print that error so while i'm doing that it is automatically refreshed and you can see my contact list displayed here but yeah if you have an error uh, in that case uh, you can also handle that error so handle error whatever way you want you can in fact use one of the components from the lwc sample galleries lwc recipes app uh, there's an error panel component which you can use that component copy paste that code from there to here and you can start using it now you can see that i can see my component here and uh, everything is ready you can push this to your scratch org 
and then uh, use that component there okay now that we have finished all implementation of the lighting web component and we have tested using the local development environment it's time to commit those changes so i'll go here and i'll say contact list component implementation and let us commit these changes and push the changes to the github if you go back to the github and you can see that contact list component implementation is also there and i don't like this name say first socket query for my pull request so what i can do here is i can edit that and let us say contact list list implementation altogether let us save this pull request name and now it is called as contact list information and once the changes are reviewed you can merge these changes into your master branch okay that's all now that we have built the lighting web component fully and also merged the changes to the master branch of the repository one question that can be obvious is can i use other extensions very much the benefit of visual studio code is you can get the extensions from the marketplace and install it in your uh, vs code developer environment so you can search for something like salesforce in the extensions marketplace and you can find a lot of community built extensions one of my favorite such extensions is the apex pmd which allows us to run the static analysis directly in vs code on apex and visual force pages the other extension which we have been using which i have not talked about much is the prettier extension which helped me format my files when i was saving so if you don't notice there when I was saving my HTML or JavaScript files, the files are automatically formatted whenever I save the file. And one more extension which I love most is GitLens, with which you can uh, see who saved the or who changed the files in the GitHub. It gets all that information. Whenever you open a file, it shows that information on top of your file name on who has changed the file and when it was changed and one more uh, extension that can be of your interest is github prs with which you can manage all your pull requests what next getting started with the salesforce developer tools is easy and we recommend trailhead as your starting point there are a number of quality trails specifically built around the vs code alm debugging and more and after that, check out our open GitHub repo for our VS Code extensions. And you can also brush up on our documents and let us know how else we can improve your experience. With that said, thank you so much. See you again in some other session later. Bye bye.